What's going on, guys? Mr. Tang back at it again, January 8th, 2021. Um, it's, this is like three days in a row now that I'm making these, so uh, that's kind of cool. Um, back at it again with Miles Morales, Spider Man, uh, by Jason Reynolds. Um, I was actually pretty surprised by the last video I was able to read for like 50 minutes straight. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to do that again. I do have some sparkling water to help quench the thirst. Um, thank you so much for being here, watching this with us, um, reading along with us. Uh, powerful, powerful book. Um, we're coming up on some heavy stuff. Um, sometimes the bad guys aren't always who they seem, you know? And I think that's kind of where we're going to get get digging at here in a little bit. Um, and the idea that sometimes we have to do more than we think we're capable of. Um, and that doesn't always mean, you know, never resorting to violence or anything like that, but just kind of standing up for those who are marginalized, who need it, you know. And for some of you out there, you know, have reached out to me, um, dealing with a lot of stuff on, on your end, you know, just don't give up. There's people out there that will have your back. Uh, sometimes you just have to seek after it, you know. Um, you'll be surprised who you can trust, who you can talk to, who has your back. Um, just don't give up. You know, it's, 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 it's tough times out there. Um, but the golden rule, no matter what you believe in, is treat others the way you want to be treated. And um, ultimately, just... We have the power and ability to just be the best that we can be. So uh, with that said, um, a lot of crazy things happening in this world and we can't just, we can't give up, okay? We gotta keep fighting a good fight. And that means just being the best versions of yourself. All right, so chapter seven, Miles and Alicia just got into it a little bit with uh, Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain seems to be up to something here. <clears throat> Chapter seven. All right, now, spill it. Miles had finally gotten back to the dorm after his class afternoon classes, his stomach morphing from a tight knot to an empty pit after take talking with Alicia. The same thoughts repeating over and over in his mind. It's over for me. I'm out of here. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Yankee had just turned on his Nintendo as Miles dug through his old closet and pulled out his mask. Where do I even begin? Miles started. First, somebody robbed the store yesterday, he said flat. While I was trying to get that extra credit from Blafus, someone broke into. He caught himself in a lie. No one broke into the store because he had left it wide open. Someone came into the store and stole a whole bunch of sausages. What? Yankee immediately paused the game, glanced back at Miles, who was still digging in his closet. Sausage? Yep, sausage in a can. Miles flung his mask and suit on his bed. And they think I did it. Who thinks you did it? Miles rubbed his face. Dean Kushner, my folks. That's why they came up here. They think I had something to do with it. Miles shook his head. I mean, not for nothing. I don't even like sausage in a can. Who does? It's gross. Yankee unpaused the game, his thumbs working the controller as Mario jumped on bricks and onto the head of Goombas. Gross. Stupid. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Dean Kushner fired me from the store and the whole work study program. Now my folks have to pay out of pocket to cover my food and the luxurious life in this funk box with you. Yankee paused the game again, turned back toward Mouse. My man, I know you're mad right now, and you're just talking, but this ain't no funk box. If it is, it ain't because of me. First of all, you are the one who wears the same jeans every day. That's how you break them in. Whatever. And second of all, I'm Korean. We don't have B.O. What? Just trust me on that one. Miles looked at Yankee like he had two heads. Look, the point I'm trying to make is I can't let my parents pay for this. From my mistake. Things are already tight, and the amount of money they're probably going to have to shell out to keep me in this dorm is going to jam them up. Miles knocked on his forehead. So, I gotta figure something out. Just beg Cushy Cushy for your job back. Thought about it, but let's be real. When was the last time you've ever seen Kushner smile? 
I mean, he won't even loosen up his face. Why would he loosen up on me? Not to mention, none of this is probably going to matter anyway, because I just flipped out on Chamberlain and smashed a desk. So they'll probably expel me for destruction of school property. You did what? A desk? Dude, what's wrong with you? Genki, I'm telling you. He's... There's something about him. I just couldn't help it. Surprisingly, he didn't say nothing to me after class, or even try to stop me from leaving. So... We'll see. I mean, he ain't gonna write you up. But still might be screwed. Well, you still might be screwed. So what you gonna do? First from Alicia, now from Genki. This was a question Miles was getting tired of hearing. Genki leaned back in his chair, rested his arms on his belly. He noticed the suit on the bed. Wait, is the sabbatical over already? Are you being... Are you about to become a hero for hire? I hope so. Or are you just about to go find a replacement desk for Chamberlain? Which I have to tell you, doesn't really seem like a job for Spider-Man. No, no, and no. Miles grabbed the mask and got up from the bed. There was a mirror between his and Genki's bed. The same mirror Miles checked out his jeans and sneakers in every day. The same mirror Genki used to imitate Miles checking out his jeans and sneakers every day. Looking at his reflection, he flipped the mask inside out, pulled it down over his head, over his face, all black. You're just like me. Miles swallowed, staring at himself, but not himself. You're just like me. I don't know. Miles yanked the mask off, flipped it back to the original side, and put it back on. He grabbed the suit from the bed. I just need to go clear my head. By clearing his head, Miles meant going out for a jump and swing. A shoot and soar. He opened a window in his dorm, camouflaged out the initial exit, and crawled out onto the wall, and bl the black and red on his suit, now the colors of the red brick and mortar. Once he got onto the roof, he came out of camo mode and looked over, looked out over the campus. The regal buildings and tree-lined pathways, the quad and the courtyards, all emulating the Ivy League. And in the distance, the city, pushing into the skyline like fingers ready to grab someone everyone. Miles took a few steps back, took a deep breath, sucking in everything around him, pushing all the things already in him. Dean Kushner, his parents, Mr. Chamberlain, further down. Then he took off with a running start, jumped off the building. And from rooftop to rooftop, Miles leaped as easily as if he were jumping puddles on the sidewalk until he reached the edge of campus. Then he dove into the air, web shooting from both hands attaching to trees, telephone poles, and any other structure around him, swinging him further into the air, high above the people below, who were scattered through the streets like ants. He didn't pay attention to where he was going. He just tried to remember what it felt like to fly, what it felt like to fall, knowing he wouldn't actually hit the ground. From the clock tower to the courthouse, from the roofs of the luxury condos to those of project buildings. And before he knew it, almost as if he'd Suddenly opened his eyes, he was in his own neighborhood. The mashup of the sound hit him. Much different than the sounds of Brooklyn Visions Academy. The screeching of the bus brakes, the drowning of the the droning of the horns of taxicabs, men hollering over bouncy basketballs, music coming from both the radio and the sounds of the city itself. Miles perched on the roof of the dollar store on Fulton Street, the one where Frenchie worked, and watched it all. Before zeroing in on a group of kids getting off the bus, a blur of bright colors and fly haircuts that made them look older than they were. Miles watched as they walked down the block, laughing and joking, until they hit the corner. Once they reached the end of the street, they all stopped talking, passing by a group of older guys, one of whom said something to the youngins. Buzz, buzz. Miles' spidey sense sent vibrations around his head. Buzz. The young boys didn't wait or engage. They just split, each of them tearing off into different directions. Only one of the men broke from the crew to chase the young boys. And he targeted the one, and the one he targeted was the flyest of them all, the one with the blonde patch in his hair. Miles jumped to the next building and the next, following along with the chase. The boy dashed down the sidewalk, sometimes jumping into the street to avoid the crowd zigzagging from block to block while the guy followed close behind him. 
and then the boy with the blonde patch turned a hard left off the boulevard and bolted down a quiet street. Maybe the street he lived on, Miles thought, still looking from on high. And with nothing in the way, the man opened the stride and ran the boy down, grabbed him by his shoulders, and then to play it off, put an arm around him, yoking him up. The boy didn't scream. He didn't help yell for help. Miles knew that silence. The silence that yelling is futile and against code. Yelling only makes things worse and more dangerous. They took a few more steps, pretending everything was normal, until Miles noticed the young boy squatting, unlacing his sneakers. Buzz. Read in the paper earlier that kids are getting beaten and robbed for their sneakers. Miles' voice, Miles' father's voice swam around his head as he jumped from the building. By the time the boy handed the thief the shoes, Miles was standing right behind him. The boy's eyes widened. The thief turned around and met the red and white eyes of a spider mask. He didn't say anything, just snarled and shook his head. You should mind your business, the thief said, pulling his shirt up to flash a grip of a gun tucked in his waistband. This is my business, Miles answered. He and the man faced off on the sidewalk. The young boy silently stepped to the side, climbed the stoop of one of the houses. The man dropped his shoes. Suddenly, the tremor of Miles' spidey sense spiked, letting him know that the man was going to go for the weapon. But before he could even touch the metal grip of the pistol, Miles grabbed the man's wrist tight. Using just two fingers, he crushed a marble-like bone. He crushed the marble-like bones that helped the wrist pivot, causing the thief to howl and use his other hand to brace himself. And once he had the bent once he had bent over in pain, Miles was right there with an uppercut, mean and clean, rocking the thief backwards on his heels and onto his back. Yeah, you act tough, but you ain't nothing but a coward, Miles said, shaking his head just before jumping on top of the guy. He grabbed the thief by his shirt collar and raised his fist. Just before Miles dropped it down on the guy's face like a hammer, he caught the kid out of the corner of his eye, the blonde patch. He looked on, terrified. His eyes froze. Miles. His eyes froze. Miles. Mid bash. You're just like me. Miles stopped. He climbed off the thief. Thief who was now just a slug, salted and shriveled up on the sidewalk. Miles grabbed the gun from the guy's pants and crushed it under his feet. Then he rolled the guy over, yanked his hands behind his back. The broken wrist now grapefruit, grapefruit size. The thief yowled. yowled and Miles held his hand arms together and webbed them tight. Then he reached down and snatched the guy's shoes off. Snatched the guy's shoes off. He handed them to the kid who was shaking with fear, along with the shoes that belonged to him. Do what you want with them. Then he leaned down and got really close to the broken, bloody stick-up man's face. Tell everybody what just happened to you, and if you or any of you try it again, I will. I will know. See? You don't know me, but I know you, and I will come for you. As the kid bent down and tied the laces of his sneakers, Miles shot his web straight up to the street light and swung off. He blasted his web left, right, up, down, letting it randomly attach itself to various structures, light poles, high-rise buildings, construction scaffolding. While whipping through the air, his adrenaline eased as he was forced to deal with the fact that he'd just almost beaten a man to death. What if you killed him? Right there, in front of that kid. What if you killed him? Tears welled up in the sills of his eyes, but didn't fall. What came over you? Who are you? You're just like me. I'm not, Miles said aloud, his voice muffled by his mask. Not that anyone would have heard him anyway, because he was gliding through the sky. I'm tef Teflon, Tensile, above Brooklyn. I'm not, he repeated, cutting the web and landing on the rooftop of a school. The, mon the monumental force, the momentum forcing him into a full forward roll. Once to his feet, he snatched his mask from his face, his chest heaving, then peeked over the ledge as boys hung around outside the front door of the school. Tall, sweaty, passing a basketball back and forth like a live grenade. They all wore practice jersey of the school's team. A school not far from Miles' house. He hadn't paid much attention he hadn't been paying much attention while gliding around, 
but it seemed like his mind autopiloted him home, or at least close to home. So he took the hint and decided to continue on to his house. Miles was shocked because he Miles was shocked. He didn't even he even thought about heading that way because home didn't seem like a place Miles would want to go. Not after everything that had happened earlier in the day, especially since he didn't know if the news of the broken desk would be waiting for him there. But he had so much on his mind, so much he needed to figure out that he'd rather be in the company of his upset parents in the comfort of his own home than his stinky dorm room bombarded with the annoying chimes and dings of Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> so with the day beginning to dim, Miles slunk down the back wall of the school and decided to walk the rest of the way to his house in camouflage. Dogs being taken for walks would get excited when they passed him, their owners scolding them, unaware of Miles standing right in front of them, making faces. A white cat scoped him out, backpedaled into attack mode, arching itself into an N and hissing before dashing off under a car. But this car wasn't just any car. Actually, it was more of a house than a car. Bodega coffee cups lined the dashboard, along with random pieces of paper and trash. Garbage bags were stacked on the front seat. The sky blue paint of the car was splotched with rust. This car was as much of a part of the neighborhood as anything else. And though Miles never knew the guy's name, everyone knew that there was a man who slept in the back seat. No one bothered him. Kids spent minutes each day trying to work up the nerve to peek in at him. Today, Miles, nosy and invisible, decided to take his shot. Finally put his curiosity to rest. He peered in the back window. A tousled striped blanket lay there alone, like a sleeping ghost. The door wasn't totally closed, and an overhead light was on, but the man wasn't there. So Miles bumped the door closed closed and continued on. His block was quiet. No cars, no people, not even Fat Tony and his boys, which was weird because they were always outside, unless the cops were around. But as Miles moved farther up the street, he realized that was exactly what was going on. Police officers escorted Neek from his house. Neek, bushy bearded and balding, looked confused, like he didn't know why he was being arrested. His face was a fireball, his mouth spouting flames. Let me go! Let me go! He yelled hoarsely. Don't let them capture me! For a moment, Miles forgot no one could see him and thought Neek was talking to him. But he wasn't. He was just yelling out, breaking the code that had been upheld by the young man whose shoes were almost stolen. Miles figured Neek was probably having a flashback, a symptom of his PTSD. A white cat, most likely the same white cat from before, brushed his body against Neek's bottom step as the cops stuffed Neek in the backseat of the squad car and drove off. Once they were gone, Miles climbed up the wall, over the roof, and down the backside of the house to his bedroom window. He always left it unlocked for these moments. He raised a rickety pane and slipped into his room with the grace of a ballerina. Miles could, his, could hear his parents talking in the living room and listen to them ripe but was at least com comforted by the fact that there was no new bad news. <laughs> Stealthily, he dug through his dresser for clothes, slipping on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt over his spider suit, along with a BVA hoodie from his freshman year. Each garment changed colors as he got dressed. Everything blended into the wood of both his dresser and his floor. Then he climbed back out the window, back across the rooftop, down the face of the house, looking in all directions before letting the blue come back into his jeans and the brown return to his skin. He hit the buzzer. Who is it? Miles' father voice. Miles' father's voice came crackling through the speaker. Um, it's me. Miles leaned into the talk box. Nothing for a second. Miles? Yeah. The door clicked and Miles pushed it open and headed upstairs. His mother opened the apartment door at the exact moment he got to it. Miles? Hi, Ma. Sorry, I forgot my key. He said, closing the door behind him. His father was just sitting back on the living room couch. Bill spread out across the tape, coffee table as his parents were spending a cozy night alone doing a jigsaw puzzle. And in a sense, they were trying to figure out which pieces go where. A puzzled portrait of Bill's. Almost didn't let you in. What you doing here? Miles' father asked, cold. Miles immediately braced himself for 
We just got a call from the school. You smashed the desk? But instead he got, You supposed to be in school, son? From his mother. Miles never thought that would be, sound so sweet. Not only are you supposed to be there, I, for one, don't want you to be nowhere else. I want you to be at school so much so that you feel like a textbook. Jeff. Miles' mother sat on the arm of the couch looking at him quizzically, yet still motherly. I just... Miles started, but the words caught in his throat like a fish hook. He glanced over at the coffee table. Papers, so many of them. Numbers printed in black ink. Due, past due, final notice. White envelopes stacked up at the far corner of the table. Urgent. A pencil and pad and calculator, blurring as Miles tried to speak. I just came to say, sorry, I'm just so sorry. Miles said, his voice cracking, his eyes now back on his mother. I know, she said with a sigh. Now you've said it. We know you're sorry. What we don't know is what's going on with you. You know, I never used to like seltzer or sparkling water growing up. It's more of a soda guy. But... Soda has a lot of corn fructose, high fructose corn syrup, or you know, sugar, and so this has none of that. It's zero calories per can. I mean, it's got like these natural flavors. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I do know that these are healthier for you. Sorry, you guys don't care about that. Her eyes glassed up as she stared at Miles. My uncle's death, my school, my teacher, my newfound incarcerated cousin, my superpowers. Nothing, Miles said. Well, I mean, I guess I just feel so much pressure, but I'm fine. You sure? His mother leaned in, her eyes lasering through his layers of him, through the mask. Miles looked away and back to the coffee table, back to his father, who was looking on. Yeah. Miles nodded. I'm sure. He gave his mother a hug. I'll figure out how to make it okay. No, she pulled away. You figure school, you figure out school, your grades. That's it. Your father and I will figure all this out. You shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to, Miles said. Oh, Miles, that is what you sign up for when you become a parent. I didn't, Miles' father growled. Don't listen to him. Yes, we did. Poppy, the two of us will starve if it means you're keeping your belly full. Understand? A marble formed in Miles' throat. Speaking of full of bellies, let me pack you a sandwich to take back with you. And it's getting late, so I'm going to walk you to the train. Miles' father said, leaning forward. I told you, they're robbing people for sneakers. And even though yours ain't all that expensive, he glanced at Miles' shoes. They clean. Outside was still pretty quiet. The signs and sounds of Fat Tony and his boys, they had returned to the block and were leaning against the gate, their laughter cutting the still air. What's good, Mr. Davis? Miley Miles? Fat Tony said, tossing her hand up. What's happening, Tony? Miles' father said, closing the gate at the bottom of the stoop. Before Miles could speak, his father grabbed him by the arm and walked the opposite way. Yo, Mr. Davis, Tony called. Miles' father turned around. You saw what happened to Neek? Yeah, I saw it. What do you think he did? Tony asked. Miles glanced across the street at Neek's house. The cat was now sitting on top of the step of the stoop. It licked itself before snapping up its head to catch Miles' eye. It was as if it knew Miles was watching. It was as if it knew Miles. I have no idea, Miles' father said, shaking his head and turning back around. Miles' father was locked on the cat. Miles was locked on the cat. Eyes, strangely familiar. Almost magnetic. It cocked its head, studying Miles before standing up and bending into a ferocious arch of fur again. You're just like me. Miles swore, the cat said. Swore. He saw the cat actually fix his mouth to make those words. Miles narrowed his eyes, only to see the cat was just hissing, its tail. Waved back and forth, but not like normal. Most cats' tails 
moved like charmed serpents. This one's moved like a snake rattle. Snakes rattle. Miles' father grabbed him by the arm again, but Miles couldn't turn away. His eyes started drying out, his vision blurring, the single tail of his feral cat splitting into se several coiled tails. The cat from his dream, and the wrist of Mr. Chamberlain. Mr. Chamberlain. Come on, Miles' father said. Miles tripped over his feet, turning with his father while keeping his eyes on the cat. Mr. Chamberlain. Miles looked, on over his looked over his shoulder once more as he reluctantly headed on. His brain was firing thoughts. Well, really just one. It's Mr. Chamberlain. He wasn't sure what that actually meant, but he knew something was up with his history teacher. Something more than him just being a jerk. But there was still so much that didn't make any sense. Like, what did Chamberlain have to do with Neek? And what did Miles have to do with any of it? So, you okay? Miles' father asked. Five steps onto the walk. If you could recall what Miles was doing walking. He had resorted to more of a bumble. Not very Spider-Man-like. Uh-huh, yeah. Miles tried to shake the distraction. He stuffed his hands into his hoodie's kangaroo pouch. Then, unable to resist, looked behind him once more. For the cat. It was gone. You don't seem like it. Anything you need to talk about? Maybe about what happened today? Miles swallowed the marble, still lodged in his throat, and turned to his father. Do you... believe me? This was what mattered more than anything. It was the one thing to be accused by his dean, another to lose trust with his folks. Or you think I really stole that stuff from the store? Miles' father sighed. I believe you, son. What about her? Miles asked. Who? Your mother? Miles' father stuffed his hands into his pocket. She's just worried about you. I mean, think about it from our perspective. Our son, who we've known his whole life, who has never been in any real trouble, got suspended from school last week for basically ditching class. And then as soon as he gets back to school, loses his work-study job for stealing? Now, I don't believe you were stealing, but you said you left to go to an open mic. My son, the math and science guy, leaves work to go see what? Some singing? Rapping? Poetry? You've got to understand how this looks. You seem to be going off on the rails, Miles. Off the rails, Miles. So understandably, she's scared that you're going to be like Uncle Aaron? Yeah, like Uncle Aaron. Shoot, I never thought my brother would be pillow talk between me and my wife. But something tells me that's what I'll be tonight. Miles' father stopped walking, grabbed Miles' shoulders, peered to his eyes. Look. Just tell me everything is okay. I'm fine. Then explain why you left the store for real. I told you. Miles started walking again. His father followed suit. I went to an open mic. You went to an open mic. Father's Miles' father nodded, glaring at the side of Miles' face. For what? For extra credit. Ah, okay. Miles' father nodded, then let an awkward silence balloon between them until it burst. So, what's her name? Who? Whoever got you snooping around open mic, son. Look, I believe you when you say you went for extra credit, but something tells me that wasn't the only reason. You do know I was a teenager once, right? Somebody got your head spinning, unless you want to be the next Langston Hughes, and I don't know it. Miles shot a look at his father, who was trying to keep a smirk from becoming a smile. So what's her name? Miles shook his head. Alicia. His father chuckled under his breath. And does she know you like her? I don't know. I thought she did, but now I'm not so sure. I have two classes with her, but every time I try to say something to her, I feel all queasy. At first, I thought it was a stupid spidey sense, and it might be that too, but... But you think it's also something else? Butterflies. Miles' father sang it out in a silly, operatic voice. And, he's, and waved his hands in the air as if conducting orchestra, knocking up against his son. Whatever. Miles pushed back. Anyway, I was also going to open mic to give her this thing I wrote for her. So you really wrote a poem for this girl? Yeah. Wow. It really might be butterflies. And what happened when you gave it to her? 
I didn't. Before I had the chance to, she asked me to read it in front of everyone, and I panicked. Well, I'm happy to report that you got yours. You got that from yours truly. Miles' father pointed to himself. Your uncle was confident about women, but not me. You ever hear a story about how I met your mother? Yeah, Ma told me y'all were at a party and you were how smooth and how you were all smooth. That's how she tells it, because she's sweet. But here's the truth. It was a Super Bowl party Aaron and I were throwing at our crappy little apartment over on Lafayette. Now your mother came with her cousin, who was one of our boys, but she didn't belong there. She was a Catholic girl from the Bronx who had no business with us. But as soon as she walked in, man, I was done. I couldn't do anything else for the rest of the night. I don't even think I remember who playing in a championship. All I, all I was trying to do was figure out a way to spark conversation. But when I tell you I was nervous, I was nervous. The only thing I could figure out I could do was act like a good host and serve everybody drinks, chips, and salsa and all that. Miles and his dad stopped at the corner for a second to make sure no cars were coming before they crossed. Now, first I pour her a drink. Champagne? Miles' father pretended to tip a bottle. She thanked me and gave me a little smile. Then I said, then I asked if I can get her some chips and salsa. Hors d'oeuvres? But at the same time, I said I like, I said it like this. Or d'oeuvres? And she said yes, again laughing, which is always a good sign. So I go back across the room, grab a whole bowl of salsa. As I'm moving toward the, I'm moving through the crowd, coming up on Rio, I kick the side of the coffee table, start fumbling the bowl. He moved his hands as if he was juggling invisible balls. See where this is going? You didn't. All over her. Miles' father nodded. They cut across the park. Shortcut. A man was lying on the bench. Another man was mid-walk, patting his pockets, checking for something he clearly had, he clearly had forgotten. A crowd of teenagers joked with each other. A whole bowl of salsa, Miles' father confirmed. And what did she do? Miles, did you hear me? I spilled a whole bowl of salsa on her. She flipped out. Miles' father burst into laughter. But then, I mean, how y'all end up together? Ah, uh, that's not important. What's important is, I don't think we should have this. I don't think we would have. What's important is, I don't think we would have if I didn't spill the salsa. He put his hands on his head, braided his fingers together. So that poem you wrote her, that's your salsa. You gotta spill it on her, you understand? Like you mean read it to her? Exactly. Spill the salsa, son. Miles' dad's smile was self-assured, as if he knew this was a fatherly moment. The gem. They were on the other, on, they were on the other end of the park, standing up at the steps leading down to the train station. Miles dropped his shoulder. And what about Uncle Aaron? What about him? Miles' father snapped back into seriousness, his body tightening, his eyes lowering. I mean, what was his way of getting girls? Miles' father took his hand and swiped across his mouth, as if wiping a secret words before they were heard. You know, I don't really know. But he did it. He did it a lot. He bit down at his bottom lip, gave a single head shake, then reached into his back pocket pulled out a folded up piece of paper, slapped it in on the other palm. Guess this is as good a time as any, he said all huffy, handing the paper to Miles. Miles unfolded it, recognized the pencil and the capital letters. Dear Mr. Davis, my name is Austin. I'm 15 years old and I'm writing you from ju the juvenile ward. I got your info from my grandmother. She knew your name. And I think she found your address on the internet. I hope you don't mind. She'd been telling me about you and said that I should reach out and try to get to know the other half of my family. My father's name was Aaron. And if this is the right address, then you are Aaron's brother. That makes you my uncle. I'm not sure if you ever knew about me and my grandmother. And my grandmother told me that you and my father didn't really get along. So maybe you didn't know, or maybe you did, but was too mad to reach out. I can surely understand that. Anyway, I'm sure you know my father is no longer around, and so I don't know if this is overstepping my boundaries, but I would like for you to maybe come visit, come see me. Saturdays are my visitation days. 
I don't get any visitors. And it would be cool to see family, even if we don't know each other. I hope you get this letter. Austin Davis. Miles folded the letter back up and tried to hide his skepticism, tried to bite his tongue. Did you know about him? Of course not. I mean, I hadn't really talked to Aaron. I hadn't talked to Aaron in a long time. And whenever I did, it was to tell him to stay away from you. So you didn't even know this kid existed. Not until this past Sunday when I opened the mail. The paper Miles' mother was holding when he come to the bath come from the bathroom. The one that snatched the color from his face. Miles' mind was reeling. His tongue was now unbitten. Well, I did. He did what? I knew about him. I mean, not until yesterday, but he sent me a letter too. To BVA? Yeah. Miles handed a letter back to his father. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to be mad about it, but yeah. I don't like this, son. Miles' father whacked his head, stuffed the paper back into his pockets, and folded his arms across the chest. We have to go see him, Miles blurted, his insides rattling. Absolutely not. Miles' dad snapped. I mean, look, I don't know. It's not that simple. Well, what does Ma think? Miles knew that his mother had a soft spot for kids and hated to see them struggling. They didn't have to be family for her to feel for them. She loved Yankee like he was her son. But if Miles' mom knew that there was even a chance that Austin could be related, despite how she felt about Aaron, she would want to connect with him. She'd have to. Miles' father blew a hard breath, one that inflated his cheeks. You know your mother. She thinks I should go see him. Well then, I mean, that's it. You gotta go, and I'm going with you. First of all, watch yourself order me around, kid, Miles' father said steely. You still on thin ice, and punishment is not off the table. Just because you feel like you can walk out on work don't mean you can walk out on me. Not to mention, you withholding the truth. Sorry, sorry. Miles adjusted his tone. But well, since we're both being honest about stuff, you should also know I wrote him back. You did what? Miles' father gripped the top of his own head as he was trying to rip off his neck. I had to. I mean, it was like I couldn't help it. I just... I just did. I just dropped it off in the mail this morning. Miles' father turned away from Miles and turned back to him and stared at the roof into the sky. Blah, blah, blah. Then turned back to him and stared into the sky as if searching for the answer on a half-clouded moon. Look, I don't know if any of this is a good idea, Miles. I mean, we don't even know this kid. That's why we got to meet him. That's why we got to go and meet him. We don't even know if he's telling the truth. Miles looked at his father gave him an unwa unwavering side eye. Okay, okay. His dad threw his hands up. The kid's probably telling the truth. I mean, he ain't got no real reason to scam us. Exactly. So... So please get on that train and go back to school. Miles' father was suddenly full of frustration. His cell phone chimed. He checked it, then grabbed Miles by the back of the neck, pulled him in for a rough but loving hug, almost bouncing Miles' body off of his own. That's your mother. Let me get home so I can talk to her about it again. All right, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, that was chapter seven of Miles Morales by Jason Reynolds. I love Spider-Man. Um, he's always been my favorite superhero. Um, growing up in Queens, New York City, Peter Parker was from Queens, um, struggling kid. He didn't use his powers to make extra money or nothing like that. So it was kind of like um, it was kind of like a glimpse into the real world, um, but also like that same idea of an escape was there. So Spider Man was my guy, and now to have a Spider Man who's half black, half Puerto Rican um, means that there's there's a different representation out there. You know, um, if you haven't seen the movie, um, was it Into the Spider Verse? incredible movie go check that out i just finished playing the miles morales spider-man game on a playstation that was a lot of fun too um just having a different um depiction of spider-man different representation means a lot i think it means a lot to a lot of kids out there and uh i know for me as a grown man it definitely means a lot so thanks for spending your time with me i uh, hope you are enjoying this and i'll get your chapter eight pretty soon all right 
Have a good one.